The Wizard by Mary Hartwell Catherwood. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That was a cold evening. The snow was just as dry as flour and had been beat down till the road looked slick as a ribbon far up and far down and squeaked every step. I pulled Mar on our sled. All the boys went home by the creek to skate, but I was afraid Mar would get cold. She's such a little thing. I like to play with the girls if the boys do laugh, for some of the big ones might push Mar down and hurt her. She misses her mother, so I babies her more than I used to. We's almost out of sight of the schoolhouse and just where the road elbows by the widow Briggs's place when something passed us like whiz. I'd been pulling along with the sled rope over my arm and my hands in my pockets and didn't hear a team or anything, but it made me shy off the side of the road and pretty near upset Mar. School lets out at four o'clock and dusk comes soon after that, but it was woolly gray yet so you could see plain except in the fence corners and the thing that passed us was a man riding on nothing but one big wheel. Oh, see there, says Mar, scared as could be. I felt glad on her account we's close to Widow Briggs's place. It would be easy to hustle her over Briggs's fence, but the thing runs so still and fast it might take fences as well as a straight road. The man turned round after he passed us and came rearing back away up on that wheel, and I stood as close before the sled as I could. He sat high up in the air and wiggled his feet on each side of the wheel, and I never saw a camel or elephant or any kind of wild thing at a show that made me feel so funny. But just when I thought he's going to cut through us, he turned short and stopped. He had on an overcoat to his ears and a fur cap down to his nose and hairy gloves on and a little satchel strapped over his shoulder and I saw there was a real small wheel behind the big one that balanced him up. He wasn't sitting on the tire neither but on a saddle place and the big wheel had lots of silver spokes crossing back and forward. Whose children are you? says the man. Nobody's, says I. But who owns and switches you? says he. The schoolmaster switches me, says I, but we ain't owned since mother died. Marar began to cry. We live at Uncle Mosey's, says she. They don't want to give us away. The man laughed and says, Are you right, sure? But I hated to have her scared, so I told her the wheel couldn't hurt her, nor him either. I've seen the cars many a time, I says, and I've seen balloons and read in the paper about things that went on three wheels, but this... It's a bicycle, says he. I'm a wheel man. That's what I thought, says I. Then he wanted to know our names. Mine's Steel Petticord, I says. And this is my little sister, Marar. His eyes looked sharp at us, and he says, Your mother died about six weeks ago? Yes, sir, says I. Tomorrow won't be a very nice Christmas for you, says he. No, sir, says I, digging my heel in the snow, for he had no business to talk that way and make Marar feel bad, when I had a little wagon all whittled out in my pocket to give her, and she cried most every night anyhow, until Aunt Abby threatened to switch her if she waked the family any more. I slept with the boys, but when I heard Marar sniffling in the big bed, a good many nights I slipped out and sat by her, and whispered stories to take her attention as long as my jaws worked limber, but when they chattered too much with the cold I'd lay down on the cover with my arm across her till she went to sleep. I like Marar. They said we might go up to Cousin Andy Sanders's to stay over, says I. We don't have to be at Uncle Moses at Christmas. That's some consolation, is it? says he. I was not going to let him know what the relations did, but I never liked relations outside of our place. At Aunt Ibby and Uncle Moses, the children fight like cats, and they always act poor at Christmas and make fun of hanging your stockings or setting your plate, for you'd only get ashes or corn cobs. Aunt Ibby keeps her sleeves rolled up so she can slap real handy, and Uncle Mose has yellow streaks in his eyes and he shivers over the stove and keeps everybody else back. At Cousin Andy Sanders' they have no children and don't want them. You durst hardly come in out of the snow, and all the best things on the table will make you sick. If there is a piece in the paper that is hard to read, and ugly as it can be, they will make you sit still and read it, and if you get done too quick, they will say you skipped, and you have to read it out loud while they find fault. I knew Cousin Andy Sanders never had any candy or taffy for Christmas, but Marar and me could be peaceful there, for they don't push her around so bad. Well, hand me your rope, says the man, and I'll give you a ride. I liked that notion, so I handed him the rope and he waited till I got on the sled in front of Mar. That's Widow Briggs's homestead, isn't it? He said just before he started. I told him it was and asked if he ever lived down our way. He laughed and said he knew something about every place and then he set the wheel a-going. Mar held tight to me and I braced my heels against the front round of the sled. The fence corners went faster and faster and the wind whistled through our ears while you could not see one dry blade in the fodder shocks move. Ain't he a wizard? says I to Mar. 
We turned another jog and the spokes in the wheel looked all smeared together. It did beat horse racing. I got excited and hollered for him to go it, old wizard, and he went it till we passed Cousin Andy Sanders's before I knew the place was nigh. Cast loose now, mister, we're much obliged, says I. But he kept right on like he never heard me. So I yelled up louder and told him we's there, and he turned around his head a minute and laughed. Please let go, mister, I says. That's Cousin Andy Sanders' is way back there. We're obliged, but we'll have to go back. The wizard never let on. He whizzed ahead as fast as ever. I thought it was a mean trick for him to play on Marar and wished I could trip up his wheel. It would be dark long before I got her back to Cousin Andy Sanders's, and the wizard whizzed ahead like he was running off with us. I had a notion to cut the rope, but there was no telling when I'd get another, and it was new. I made up my mind to do it, though, when we come along by our old place, but there the wizard turned round and jumped off in the road. I picked up the end of my rope and shook my head because I was mad. "'Why didn't you let go?' says I. "'Haven't I brought you home?' he says. I looked at the shut-up house and felt a good deal worse than when I thought he was running off with us. "'Oh, Steely,' says Marard, "'let's go in and stay. I want to come home so bad.' He was a man grown and I was only ten years old, but he ought to know better than to make Mark cry till the tears run down her chin. I'd been to look at the house myself, but never said a word to her about it. Once about noon I slipped up there by the cornfields roundabout and sat on the fence and thought about Mother till I could hardly stand it. The house looked lonesomer than an old cabin about to fall, because an old cabin about to fall has forgot its folks, but all our things were locked up here, except what Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders had carried off. Our sale was to be in January. The snow was knee-deep in the yard and drifted even on the porch, but tracks showed where Aunt Ibby walked when she got out a load of provisions and bedclothes. She had the front door key and took even the blue and white cover lid with birds wove in that I heard Mother say was to be Mars and the canned fruit for fear it would freeze when our cellar is warmer than their stove. She said to Uncle Mose when I was by unbeknown that Mar and me would have ten times as much property as her children anyhow and she ought to be paid more for keeping us. She might had our money for all I cared, but I did not know how to stand her robbing things out of Mother's house and wished the sale would come quick and scatter them all. The wizard leaned his chin on his breast and looked pitiful out of his eyes at Marar, for it seemed like the tears had a notion to freeze on her face, only she kept them running down too fast, and he says, Let's go into the house. Oh, do, Steely, says Marar, hugging my knee, for I was alongside the sled. And I'll cook all your dinners, and we'll hang up our Christmas stockings every Sunday, says she. And Aunt Ibby's boys won't durst to take away my lead pencil Mother give me, and if you see them coming here, you'll set bounce on them. Marar, says I. We will go in and make a fire, and act like Mother's just gone out to a neighbor's. Then she begun to laugh, and one of her tears stuck to an in-spot that comes and goes in her face like it was dented with your finger. But now you mind, I says, if Aunt Ibby or Uncle Mose goes to whip us for this, you tell them I put you up to it and made you go along with me. Marar looked scared. And you tell them, says the wizard, lifting his wheel across the snow toward the gate, that I put you both up to it and made you go along with me. I pulled Marar over the drifts, and we went to the side door. Aunt Ibby's got the big key, I says, and I'll have to raise a window while you wait here. The windows were all locked down, but we went round and round till the one in the shed gave way, and I crawled through and bursted the latch off the kitchen door. I breathed so fast it made my heart thump when I unlocked the side door and let the wizard and Marar into the sitting room. I noticed then he'd hung his wheel on the limb of a tree, for it glittered. Bounce ain't here to jump on us, is he, Marar? says I. No, and he hates to stay at Cousin Andy Sanders's, says she. Bounce would come to the schoolhouse and kind of cry till I asked the master, please may I go out. And then Bounce and me'd have a talk behind the schoolhouse, and I'd tell him I could not help it, and he'd own that he might live at Aunt Ibby's with us if he could only keep from chawing up their miserable yellow dogs, and we'd both feel better. But I did miss him that minute I opened the door, when here he come like a house of fire, and lit down on the floor panting and pounding his tail and laughing, and then he jumped up and pawed us in the dark till Marar had to hold him round the neck to keep him still while I got a light. He must have snuffed our tracks when we whizzed past Cousin Andy Sanders's. I felt to the pantry and put my hand in the candle box, but Aunt Ibby never left one. I knew there was a piece in a candlestick in the shed cupboard, though. It burnt half out the night Mother died. So I got it, and the wizard scraped a match and lit the wick. The wizard and me set to then and brought in loads from the wood house. We built a fire clean up into the chimney, and Brar took the broom and swept all the dust into it. Bounce laid on the carpet and licked at us and whacked his tail till we's in a broad laugh. The fire got me warmer than I'd been since Mother died. The wizard took out a thick gold watch and wound our clock and set it. Then he says, Let's go over the house. And we did. I carried the candle and Marar and the dog went along. The wizard looked in all the upstairs presses and opened the bureau drawers. I stayed outside of the parlor and Marar and Bounce did too. 
I did not want to think of the sheet stretched in the corner, for it was not like mother under the sheet. But her picture hung up in there, and so did my father's. The wizard stayed in with the candle a good while. I heard him going from one thing to another and wondered what he was about. I'd rather gone out to the graveyard, though, and sat on the fence watching mother's and father's graves and heard the dry sumac bushes scrape together than to stepped into the parlor. Father died a year before mother, but I didn't like him the same as I did her. Then we looked down cellar, and I thought I ought to tell the wizard about the provisions and bedclothes being taken out of the house or he'd suppose mother never kept us nice. He smiled under his cap, and I found one jar of canned honey behind some barrels where Aunt Ibby overlooked it. We carried that up to the sitting room. Mar likes candid honey better than anything. Just as we come into the sitting room, I heard somebody pound on the front door. "'They're after us,' says Mar. "'Let me see to it,' says the wizard. So we stepped around the house and came back with his wheel on his arm and held the door open. The snow made outdoors light, and we saw a little fellow lead a horse and buggy through the yard into the barn lot, and he came right in carrying a couple of baskets. "'All right, Sam,' says the wizard. "'Put your horse in the stable and then build a fire in the kitchen stove.' The man he called Sam stopped to warm himself at our hearth, and I never saw such a looking creature before. He had a cap with a button on top of his head, and his hair was braided and a long tail behind. He laughed, and his eyes glittered, and they sloped up like a ladder set against the house. He was just as yellow as brass and wore a cloth circular with big sleeves, but the rest of him looked like other folks. Ra went back into the corner, and I noticed the wizard set his wheel against the wall, and I wondered if he'd left it out for a sign so the little yellow man would know where to stop. The yellow man went out to his horse, and the wizard took off his cap and gloves and coat and hung them in the sitting room. He looked nice. His eyes snapped and his hair was cut off close, except a brush right along the middle of his head. We set our chairs up to the fire, and I watched him and watched him. "'If you and that fellow travel together,' I says, "'what makes him go in a buggy and you on a wheel?' "'Oh, I like the bicycle,' says he. "'I've run thousands of miles on it. "'I sent Sam out from San Francisco by the railroad, but I came through on the wheel. "'It took me three months.' I thought he was a funny man, but I liked him, too. When Sam came in from the stable, Marar and I went to the kitchen and saw him cook supper, for one of the baskets was jam full of vittles. He heated a roasted turkey and made oyster soup and mashed potatoes and chopped cabbage. There were preserves the wizard called scotch and hot rolls and jelly and cold chicken and little round cakes that melted in your mouth and pickles and nuts and oranges, and we put the candid honey on the table. The coffee smelt like Thanksgiving. Sam waited on us, and I eat till I was ashamed. We never expected to have such a dinner in Mother's house any more. When Ra and I got down and begun to toss our oranges, the wizard told Sam to clear the things away and have his supper in the kitchen, and then to fix the beds as comfortable as he could. I'd made up my mind even if the wizard did travel ahead that Ra and Mitch stay there all night. Aunt Ibby's would think we were at Cousin Andy Sanders's, and Cousin Andy Sanders's would think we were at Aunt Ibby's. He sat in Mother's big chair before the fire, and I felt willing. If it had been Uncle Mose in the chair, I wouldn't felt willing. When a stick broke on the dog irons, we piled on more wood, and the clock ticked and struck nine, and I wished we was never going away from there again. Ra and I played and jumped, and he was blind man, and we had solid fun till we's tired out. I showed him my books, for I never took one to Uncle Moses. The boys there make you give up everything, and they lick their dirty thumbs to turn leaves. Ra and I stood and looked into the glass doors of the bookcase like we used to when the fire made them like a looking glass, and there were our faces, hers round and wide between the eyes and curly-headed, and mine long and narrow between the eyes and my hair in a black roach. I told the wizard she'd better have a bed made down by the fire, considering the blankets and comforts were most all out of visiting, and he guessed so too, and Sam helped me bring lots of quilts and a feather tick from my old room to fix up the lounge with. Sam went into the kitchen and slept by the stove. Then I undressed Mar and heard her prayers after I tucked her in. She's six years old and dressed herself before Mother died, all but hooking up. I hooked her up, and sometimes she'd swell out for mischief when she ought to swell in. But now I tended to her entirely because she missed her mother. The wizard acted like he saw something in the fire, but when Ra was asleep and I sat down by him, he pushed up my roach and he says, You're a very fatherly little fellow, Steel Petticord. It put me in mind to ask him if he's Sam's father, but he laughed out loud at the notion. Sam's smaller than you and he minds so well, says I, and I never saw a man that was so handy at girls' work. Sam's an excellent fellow, says the wizard, but I don't deserve to have a Chinaman called my son. Oh, I says, is he a Chinaman? Well, I've read about them, but I never saw one before. Then I concluded to ask the wizard what his own name was, but just then he got up from his chair and brought the other basket to the fire. Do you know who Santa Claus is? He says, talking low. I found that out two years ago, says I. Well, get her little stockings then, he says. I thought you'd like to do this yourself, says the wizard. 
He acted just like mother. We took the things out of the basket. There were toy sheep and dogs and dolls and tubs and dishes and underneath them all kinds of candies, enough to treat a school. I felt like the wizard was Santa Claus. We stuffed our little stockings till they stood alone like kegs and tied bundles to them and fastened them together and hung them on the mantelpiece. Bounce would wake up and watch us and then he'd doze off, for Bounce was fuller of turkey bones than he ever expected to be again, and Marar slept away looking like a doll in the fire shine. But all at once Bounce gave a jump and a bark. Back went the door like the wind had tore it open, and there stood Uncle Mose and Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders and the widow Briggs's grown son and two or three men behind them. They all looked scared or mad, and Aunt Ibby's face was so white that her moles all bristled. "'This is a pretty how-to-do,' says she, speaking up loud like she did on wash days or times she took a stick and drove the boys to the woodpile. "'What's going on in this house tonight? Fires and candles burning and travelers putting up, and children running away when they're let go someplace else to stay all night. You little sneak!' says she. You'll get one such a whipping as you ached for when your mother was alive. Stop, stop, says the wizard peaceably. What are you doing in this house, says cousin Andy Sanders. Are you the man I saw go past my place tonight on that wheel, pulling the children? I am, says the wizard, and I've been making notes of the personal property that has been carried out of the house. Well, says Uncle Mose, I'm the constable and this is my posse. The wizard laughed and he says, this thorn bush is my thorn bush, and this dog my dog. I did not know what he meant, and they acted as if they did not either. I arrest you, says Uncle Mose, for breaking into a house and disturbing the peace. You can't do it, says the wizard. Go in and take him, says Uncle Mose to the other men. Because this is my house, says the wizard. I swallowed my breath when he said that. I wish you'd shut the door, he says. And since tomorrow is Christmas, and I don't want to harbor any ill will, you can shut it behind instead of in front of you. I'm Steel Petticord, this boy's father, as you might all know by looking at me. Even Cousin Andy Sanders didn't jump any more than I did, but I jumped for gladness and seemed like he jumped for something else. I'm appointed guardian to the children, he says, and I don't want any impudent talk from a stranger. You pretend you don't know me, Andy Sanders, says the wizard, but I always knew you. You expected to settle on their land while Mose and his wife pillaged their goods. I didn't grow up with you for nothing. Steel Petticord died when that boy was a year old, says Aunt Nebby, and she looked so awful and so big I could hardly bear to watch her. He was killed by the Indians on his way from California after he sent his money home. He was only kept prisoner by the Indians, says my father, and sick and ill-used, but he had no notion he was dead till he got away after a few years and heard his widow was married again and even mother to another child. It's a likely story, says Cousin Andy Sanders, that a man wouldn't come forward and claim his own in such a case. Your notion of a man and mine never did agree, Andy Sanders, says my father. She wasn't to blame and her second husband was my best friend. The boy and girl are mine now. It's some robbing scheme, says Aunt Ibby, but she looked as if she knew him well enough. I've more to give them than you could have taken from them, he says, and you may begin to investigate tonight. Is that the widow Briggs's boy? he says. The Briggs boy came up and shook hands with them, and the other men stepped in and shook hands too. They all begun to talk, but Uncle Mose and Aunt Ibby and Cousin Andy Sanders left the door, and I heard them slam the gate. Marar slept right along, though the neighbors talked so loud and fast, and I sat down on the lounge at her feet, wondering what she would say Christmas morning when she found out the wizard was my own father that mother thought was dead since I was a year old. I felt so queer and glad that something in me whizzed like the wheel, and while my father was not looking and everybody sat up to the fire asking questions, I slipped over and tried to hug it around the cranks that he wiggled with his feet. You can read pieces about Santa Claus coming on a sledge, but that's nothing to having your own father that you think is dead and gone, Ride up like a regular wizard and open the house for Christmas. End of The Wizard by Mary Hartwell Catherwood. Recording by Angela.